peace be upon you. This is Saeed Mirza from willinareason.com and today we're going to be looking at meteor worship or stone worship. And this is a very interesting concept because if you understand this, then you will see what the Kaaba is actually all about. Uh, Muslims, unfortunately, have been duped into worshipping a stone. And I'm obviously referring to the Hajj al-Aswad, the black stone, which is encased in the Kaaba in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. And uh, while they claim to hold fast to the Quran and to follow it, the Quran, God's final revelation, has a stark warning for mankind about stone worship. Because stone worship is something that mankind has been doing for millennia. So let's just look at the passage in the Quran about this warning and then we're going to jump into um, an interesting video about uh, meteor worship, stone worship, and then we're going to investigate the black stone that is in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, that is housed in the Kaaba. So let's start. This is chapter 2, verses, we're going to start at verse 21, and this is Brother Garen's translation of the Quran, a complete revelation. O mankind, serve your Lord who created you and those before you, that you might be in prudent fear who made the earth for you a couch and the sky a structure, and sent down from the sky water, then brought forth thereby fruits as provision for you. So make not equals to God when you know. And if you are in doubt about what we have sent down upon our servant, then bring us Sura chapter, the like thereof, and call your witnesses other than God, if you be truthful. But if you do not, and you will not, then be in prudent fear of the fire, whose fuel is men and stones, prepared for the false claimers of guidance. Now, why is God using the term stones here? He's saying that the fire is, its fuel is men and stones. Because, again, stone worship is something that mankind has been doing uh, for millennia and continues to do. So, God is warning us that you need to be very careful. You need to be beware of these stones. And we find in the religion of Islam, at its core, that it's worshipping this black stone, the Hajjul Aswat, which is encased in the Kaaba, Saudi Arabia. So let's just look at the documentary here, um, and then we're going to jump into the analysis. Karate friends, welcome to Classics in Color, your weekly dive into some of the ancient world's wackiest facts. I'm Mark Graves, and today we're going to be looking at some theories and some evidence surrounding people in ancient Rome and Greece worshipping meteorites. My major sources for this video are two articles. The first is called Mycenaean Tree and Pillar Cult and its Mediterranean Relations. That's by Arthur Evans. And the second one is Tree Tugging and Omphalmos Hugging on Minoan Gold Rings. And that one was written by John Younger. So thank you so much to both of those scholars. Vitalis is an important term in this paper, and basically it just refers to any stone that was considered sacred to any Indo-European culture. Indo-European is a fancy word that basically refers to a wide range of cultures in India and Europe. <laughs> it's kind of this big catch-all term that we use a lot because all of these cultures are considered to have one um, very old kind of lost origin. So we think originally there was some like parent culture that branched off and evolved into all of these other cultures. So if we look at them linguistically, for example, all the different languages like Greek and Italian, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> they all have the same parent language somewhere far back in the midst of time. Or if we look at the mythology of these different cultures from India to Greece to Egypt, they have a lot of similarities and overlap that, again, we think are probably due to the fact that they had some shared origin or parent story. So Baidilis is just a rock that is considered sacred to any of these cultures that fall under this very wide umbrella. But there are a few similarities that we can talk about. So almost always these stones were left undecorated, uncarved, just plain as they fell, but they would have been placed in a sanctuary or a temple or something where they could be worshipped. Uh, these stones sometimes were considered to literally be God, but they could also just be like a, an aspect, a manifestation, a piece of God or sometimes they were just a stone that a god had chucked down <laughs> from heaven. So just, it's special to the god. It's not the god, it's just special to him. Uh, one thing that, it, it can't be confirmed, so we can't prove this one way or the other, but it's an interesting theory, is that these stones that were fallen from heaven were sort of the precursor to and maybe the inspiration for all of the statues that later appear in temples. So it's very famous now, of course, when we think of ancient temples to think of these 
giant, amazing statues of Zeus and Athena and Isis. And those may have been evolutions of what originally was just like a rock that people found and were like, oh, it came from the sky. That's really cool. And then later it became uh, the statue thing that we all know today. Uh, we think that these vitalises, these special stones were mostly meteorites. Uh, I think in a few cases they have survived and we've been able to run some tests on them and determine that Yes, indeed, this is a meteorite, uh, but more often we're just relying on ancient sources who say that this stone fell from the sky, which could of course be made of, or it could be a tall tale, but it's also perfectly reasonable uh, to think that these were actually meteorites that people found and maybe in some cases actually even witnessed falling, which is really cool to think about. Some examples of these vitalises are the Karates at Orchomenos and the Diana at Ephesus. So there was this meteorite sacred stone that was considered to either be Diana or to be like an aspect of her, which is really cool. But I think the most interesting one or one of the most interesting was the Ophthalmos at Delphi. So Delphi is a very famous city for a lot of reasons. It was sacred to Apollo and he gave his prophecies there that everyone in the ancient world listened to. But another thing about Delphi was that it was considered by the Greeks to be the center of the world literally the navel or the belly button. And apparently there was a stone there, one of these vitalises, that was considered to be like the literal, actual navel of the world. Another one of these vitalises was considered sacred to the god Baal, I think is how you say that. <laughs> He's an Eastern god, so I'm less familiar with him. But he had this sacred black stone that was used in circumcision rituals in Syria. And when Obviously, she's talking about Baal, which is who was mentioned in the Quran as um, one of the gods of a community. And the prophet came to them and said, you know, uh, to stop worshiping him. Uh, but uh, what's of interest is that there's a black stone associated with this, uh, this uh, god, Baal. And uh, Muslims also worship this black stone. Um, the other thing is circumcision. See, this is also a pagan practice that is found in Islam and Christianity, but there is no mention of this in the Quran. God says that he created uh, his, crea his creation perfect. And this is something that Muslims practice. Just trying to show you that uh, if you're born and raised in a Muslim family, uh, you have accepted all these things wholesale. And these are all pagan, uh, these are all pagan practices and th the idol worship of, of the stone itself. Uh, is something that the Quran is warning us against. So you need to be very careful. Elagabalus became the Roman emperor. He was actually raised in Syria. So he was familiar with this rite and with this stone. When he moves to Rome, he actually brings that stone with him and sets it up in a temple on the Palatine Hill of Rome, which is one of the many reasons why the Romans considered Elagabalus uh, very weird. They did not like him. Another instance of some of these sacred stones being moved occurred during the Second Punic War, when the famous Hannibal was invading Italy and putting the very existence of Rome in doubt. Uh, they managed to secure some stones and move them to Rome, that really helped their confidence. Let's take a look at a passage from the Roman historian Livy. At that time, religious scruples had suddenly assailed the citizens because in the Sibylline books, which were consulted on account of the frequent showers of stones that year, an oracle was found that if ever a foreign foe should invade the land of Italy, he could be driven out of Italy and defeated if the Idaean mother should be brought from Pessinus to Rome. They came to the king at Pergamum. He courteously received the ambassadors and escorting them to Pessinus in Phrygia, presented them with the sacred stones, which the inhabitants said was the mother of the gods and bade them carry it away to Rome. By far, my favorite story of these stones comes from the Greek historian Plutarch. He is writing about a battle between the Romans and King Mithridates. Mithridates is this amazing, fascinating figure who is an Eastern king, who basically resists Roman tyranny. But anyway, there's this big battle that's about to happen. The two armies are lined up. They're about ready to charge. And then the following happens. But presently, as they were on the point of joining battle, with no apparent change of weather, but all on a sudden the sky burst asunder, and a huge flame-like body was seen to fall between the two armies. In shape, it was most like a wine jar, and in color like molten silver. Both sides were astonished at the sight and separated. This marvel, as they say, occurred in Phrygia at a place called Atrii. So right before they go to battle, a 
stone literally falls out of the sky. What are the odds that a meteorite would hit at that exact moment? And so astonishes both armies that they basically declare a truce for that day. They take it as a sign from the gods that they are not supposed to fight. So they break it up and they don't fight that day, which is just incredible. So I am excited to hear what you guys think about that story and about the other stories that I mentioned and if you have other information that you would like to add. Thank you so much to everyone for checking out this video and special thank you to subscribers and to patrons. So there you go. This gives you a little bit of a context of what uh, uh, the next documentary is going to be talking about. The next documentary is from the History Channel, so take that with a grain of salt. But the images don't lie and the uh, you know, those who have eyes to see, they can see what is going on in Kaaba, in, around the Kaaba. So, but this gives you a context that the meteors or the stones were encased or placed in, uh, in a structure and that was, you know, uh, worshipped. And this is exactly what we find with the Kaaba, that this Hajjul Aswad, this black stone, which is probably a meteor, is encased in the, the structure of the Kaaba and Muslims worship this Kaaba. Uh, they circle it and, and whatever the stories they come up with, uh, if you have eyes to see, you see what is going on. You will say, yeah, this is just straight up, you know, worship of this stone. So, but let's just look at the documentary. Again, I wouldn't pay too much attention on what the experts they are saying because, you know, it's History Channel. But at the same time, you have the pictures, the images. You can see for your, with your own eyes what's going on there. Uh, there really is no uh, justification for Mecca. It is home to one of the world's largest religious structures, the Grand Mosque. In the center courtyard of this immense edifice stands a 43-foot-tall granite cube known as the Kaaba, the House of God. Five times a day, every day, almost two billion Muslims across the world turn and pray towards this striking now, this is the famous prostration, sajada, that Muslims, uh, you know, they, this is their trademark. And if you tell them, you ask them, what is this you're doing? You know, they're saying, we're prostrating to God. Okay. And then there you see, you see where they're prostrating to. So, you know, God said in the Quran, he says, wherever you turn, there is the face of God. So there is no way you can prostrate to God in this position because uh, God is everywhere. You see? But uh, they are just actually following their ancestors blindly, but they have to come up with justifications for that black monument the holiest and most sacred site in all of islam why because embedded in the eastern corner of the shrine is perhaps the most sacred stone in all the world the black stone of mecca for no, he's calling it the Black Stone of Makkah, but we know that the Muslims call it the Hajjul Aswad. That's what they say it is. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's a stone and they're worshipping it. They're kissing it and they think it has some powers. Um, and let's just see what this guy has to say, the doctor, the professor. The world's 1.8 billion Muslims, this stone is crucial. When Muslims face in the direction of Mecca, they face in the direction of that stone. This object, as simple as it might be, is of incredible significance to the Muslim faith because it is said to have fallen from heaven at the commands of Allah at the time of Adam and Eve. And it was said to have marked the position of the first temple, which obviously becomes Mecca itself. Then the story is that that stone gets lost during the flood because Muslims have the same flood story that the Jews do from the Hebrew Bible. Then that stone for Muslims is rediscovered by Abraham. So Abraham with his son Ishmael build in Mecca the first place of prayer. Okay, so... Uh... Abraham and his son, they uh, they built uh, this stone idol. This is what he's saying. Um, by the way, God doesn't use the word Mecca. He said the first house that was established for mankind was in Bakka. Okay, not Mecca. Uh, this is their stories. The Muslims came up with that Mecca was actually uh, called Bakka back in the day. But the Quran uses the word Bakka. Uh, but regardless, uh, the man, Abraham, who was a staunch monotheist, whose own people were worshipping statues, things carved out of stone. 
he destroyed those statues and as a result they threw him in the fire and God preserved him and then he left his people. Would this man, after doing all that, would he go in the middle of the desert and set up a structure, a stone structure, and start bowing and prostrating towards it, start worshiping it? Does that, do you think that's the kind of man we're talking about here? That's why Mecca is important to Muslims, because this is the first place of prayer to the one God. Over time, it gets worn away, the building gets rebuilt. In 605, the Prophet Muhammad himself is the one that places that stone in its place. This is again coming from the Hadith literature. This is the stories that were uh, written down by a man called Bukhari uh, many years after Prophet Muhammad's death. And, uh, you know, these are all fictions and tales. The Quran nowhere talks about Muhammad placing any stone and uh, worshipping it or anything of that sort. This is what I'm trying to say. This All of this stuff is coming from the Hadith or Muslims are just blindly following their ancestors into these practices. That's part of what gives it power. Each year, millions of Muslims make a pilgrimage or Hajj to the Kaaba. Once there, visitors take part in a series of rituals called Tawaf, which includes circling the Kaaba seven times. The word Tawaf, as used in the Quran, just means to walk about, to mingle. It does not mean to circle anything seven times. The word seven is not used in the Quran. This is a verifiable fact. And by the way, the Buddhists and the Hindus, they also circumambulate uh, structures. If you know anything about Hinduism, when the couple is getting married, uh, they circle the fire seven times. So these are all pagan rituals that were incorporated into this religion of Islam. And they made up stories to support that by basically saying that the prophets and messengers who came to destroy these idols, they were the ones who set them up. In the belief that it will bring about true humility by linking them with God, the black stone is therefore one of the focal points of the Hajj ceremony that every Muslim certainly tries to achieve during their lifetime. And they will then enter the central court of Mecca and if possible, try to kiss the black stone in emulation of Muhammad who was said to have set it up in this position in the year 605 AD. Certainly the stories that have been built around it really pull people in. And some people suggested that maybe it's something in the stone itself uh, that pulls people in. So now they go into this theory about the supernatural abilities of the stone and, you know, maybe it's radioactive or, you know, it has some power, etc., etc. Mm, it's just a stone. This is stone worship. This is... This is something that the Quran talks about many times to refrain from, to not, um, you know, that we just read the passage in the Quran that talks about, you know, the fire uh, whose fuel is men and stones. Uh, so uh, we need to be very critical when we look at these things and the stories associated with them because this is just pure idol worship. This is stone worship. That's what I'm trying to get to you. And I know as Muslims uh, born and raised on this um, this idea that the Kaaba is sacred and that the stone is sacred. It's very difficult for Muslims to see what's going on. Uh, but if you just look at the images that uh, this uh, documentary has, uh, for instance, let, let's look at this one. See, this has got this guy, you know, sticking his face in there and kissing it. Uh, by the way, there's stories associated with this stone uh, that it has turned black. It was before it was white and turned black because of the sins of men. Basically uh, saying that this stone has some power to, you know, take away your sins, to forgive you. Now, this is something that God alone has the power. He has the power to forgive men. So by saying these things, by believing in them, Muslims are basically ascribing power to the stone and ascribing a partnership to God. So this is nothing sacred about it. Uh, this is a stone idol that was erected and the Nabataeans, who were the precursors of the uh, Arabs, they were into stone worship. Uh, and, you know, you can look up these terms like Beetle and Nabataean idols and you'll see that this is what they were always doing. So this is nothing, you know, really um, new that I'm saying here, but a lot of people, they don't know that uh, what this thing is and and you know they think oh you know this is something that was sanctioned by the Mo by the prophet muhammad uh no it was not and the quran it nowhere uh, tells you to go worship stones or idols or anything of that sort the quran is against all these things um so anyway i thought this was of some use 
to people who are questioning these things. Obviously, a lot of people in the comments are going to respond back saying, you don't know anything or, you know, we don't really worship the Kaaba and we don't, we're worshiping Allah and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, no, if you're going there and you're doing these things, uh, then you think that this thing is special and it has power. Um, you, you don't think God can forgive you from where you are right now if you just ask him for forgiveness. Why do you need to make all this the trip all the way there? Uh, as far as the Hajj is concerned in the Quran, um, that's a separate topic. I don't want to get into that because it's going to be a long video. Uh, but suffice it to say that Hajj is no more because the location of this Masjid al-Haram, it's not there anymore either the Kaaba what's the Kaaba is just a stone idol and they build this structure around and they're calling it a Masjid Haram but it has nothing to do with the Masjid Haram Masjid Haram was at the time of the Prophet and the commandments to do all those things were at the time of Muhammad uh, that time has passed it is not applicable upon the believers anymore we are still to hold fast to the book of God and practice the things there that are therein but these rituals uh, this these pagan rituals have no place uh, for a believer and they should not be doing these things because you are actually just following your ancestors blindly and this is something that Quran warns us not to do. Anyway, that's it for now. God willing, until next time, peace and blessings be upon you.